Welcome to Hindu Analysis, July 3, 2018. Today we have 8 articles in the Hindu newspaper. They are, the first one is the Kaveri Management Authority, second one is Census 2021, third one is Intellectual Property Rights, fourth one is Cloudburst, fifth one is Reforming Higher Education, sixth one is Interpol Red Notice, seventh one is Appointment of CVC and eighth one is How to List the Cases Better. So let's see all these articles one by one. The first one is Kaveri Management Authority. So the Kaveri Water Management Authority at its first meeting has directed Karnataka to release water to Tamil Nadu and other states of Kaveri Basin. So this notification of CRMA was notified on June 1st, 2018 by the central government. So what are the roles of Kaveri River? So there are certain roles performed by the Kaveri River Management Authority. So the first one is to oversee the storage, which means it oversee how much water is stored there so that it could separate the amount of water to each and every state. The second one is apportionment regulation and control of Kaveri water. So how much proportion each state should avail. All these things are taken care by this Kaveri River Management Authority. The third one is monitor the daily water levels. And fourth one is inflows and storage position at major reservoirs. So these are the roles which are performed by the Kaveri River Water Management Authority. So the next article is Census 2020. So the process of Census 2021 has started with the notification of Registrar General of India under the Ministry of Home Affairs. So the house listing is to be begin in 2020 and the head count is to be begin in 2021. So these are the plans uh, that they have as of now. What is the major advancement in this census is whatever the data that is collected has to be stored electronically. So this is one major advancement because what if we get the data electronically we could uh, calculate anything based on the data available and we can provide uh, facilities to the uh, vulnerable sections or anyone so and any breach on the census data shall be punished under IT Act so it is a kind of like warning so so the next article is intellectual property rights so the ministry has made two amendments to the intellectual property rights regarding the imported goods enforcement rules 2007 so what are these two amendments we are going to see so the first one is the power vested with the customs authority to seize the imported products based on compliance of patent infri infringement has been revoked which means the custom authorities are uh, should not be allowed to uh, seize the imported products on the basis of compliance of patent infringements so the second one is the right holders uh, who are the patent holders or who are the this intellectual ipr holders they must oblige to communicate any amendment or cancellation or suspension or reaction that concern this ipr to the commissioner of Conce commissioner of customs so that they can make the steps or so that they can update or so that they can take steps according to the updated information which is provided by the right holder so this amended law will permit the customs authorities to cancel his patent from its record based on the order passed by the ipr appellate board so the next article is the cloud bust in uttaragand so the indian meteorological department labels sudden heavy downpour measuring 100 millimeter per hour as the cloud bust so this is the definition of cloud bust so imd describes the sudden heavy downpour measuring over 100 mm per hour so they last for a few minutes in a small area so these all are the definition of what it is a cloud burst so a cloud burst can cause flash floods and landslides and on average most places in india get around 20 mm of rain in 24 hours during the monsoon so it is the, like the norm, uh, normal or average rainfall uh, parameters but the cloud burst is uh, like 100 mm per hour so the cloud bursts generally descend from very high vertically formed clouds, sometimes extending up to 15 km up. So the windward sides of the mountains are conducive for generating the thunder clouds with huge updrafts, which explains frequent cloud bursts in Ladakh and Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh. So here only there is a major possibility of getting this cloud burst. So only this Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh are more prone to this cloud burst. The next article is reforming higher education. So it is a very important article. So the government has issued the draft Higher Education Commission of India Bill 2018 which seeks to repeal this UGC Act which is University Grants Commission Act and provides for setting up of Higher Education Commission of India. So this is the news. So this new commission HECI will cover all the fields of education except medical, agriculture and universities established under state and central acts. So it is going to cover all 
all the universities except these medical agriculture and state and central universities. So this UGC was established in 1956 to cope up with the increasing complexities of the systems because there are a lot of complexities in managing the uh, management oriented academic uh, institutions. So to make it ease, the UGC was established in 1956 to reduce the complexity. But also UGC was accorded with academic and grant giving roles. So departure, so what it is departure means departure of the grant giving only. So the HECE is not provided with the grant giving facilities, which means the HECE is not not capable of giving or dispersing uh, grants to the institutions or academic uh, universities. It is only going to give the standards or norms of the institutions of how to perform. Then who can uh, able to see all these grant related activities means it is by the MOHRD which is the Ministry of Human Resource Development reforming higher education. So first one is the promoting the quality of the instructions given by the uh, institutions to the students. The second one is maintaining of academic standards. So it is also going Going to set the standards of on which each and every academic institution should perform. So the third one is fostering the autonomy of higher education institutions. So it is going to improve the autonomy of higher education institution. So the fourth one is comprehensive and holistic growth of the education and research in field of science and research. In future, if HEC is going to get implemented, then it will be act as a single regulator. So which help in reducing the complexities possessed by the multiple bodies in the educational sector. So these are all the regulators, but in order to to make these complexities lesser we are going to uh, now have a single regulator which is HECI. So early 1990s marked the galloping growth of the sector with the setting up of many private universities led to more regulatory bodies. So why these uh, regulatory bodies are large in number means this is one of the major reason because in early 1990s there is a, a large number of growth of private universities so which led to the many regulatory bodies uh, which is uh, not at all under the uh, control of government sometimes. So to make all these uh, functions efficiently, we have to uh, first make a single regulator which is nothing but the HECA in this case. So mushrooming of institutions and the steady decline of standards in most of them have not done much good to the image of the government and the architecture of the regulation. So how this HECE will going to synergize with the professional bodies like Bar Council is also not clear until now. HECE has been accorded with the function to specify the norms and standards for grant of autonomy and graded autonomy. So HECE only deals with the quality not with the grants or grant dispersing and all. So the recent initiatives of encouraging public institutions to raise the user charges and HEFA loan for development of institution is also linked with this. HEFA loan means higher education financing agency. So it is going to give the loan to the institutions for the development of their infrastructure. Conflict of interest arising out of the multiple roles to be played by the proposed members of the HECE is also a point of concern. So the proposal appears to be a plausible one if the public expenditure in the academy sector continues to hover around the present level of over 1% of the GDP against the minimum requirement of 2%. Major issues uh, why we need HGC means we want to make the universities the hub of scientific and technological research and restoring the value of education in social sciences and humanities, ensuring the enrollment of the poor students, improving the quality of the instructions by the faculties to the students, addressing the concerns of the faculty shortage. So these are the uh, issues we are going to resolve if at all this HECE is getting implemented. So it requires a quantum jump in allocation of public resources to this sector. So like as we said, uh, the 2% of GDP is actually required, but we are now hovering around 1%. So if at all it's getting implemented, it will be like a quantum jump in the public allocation or allocation of public resources to this academic sector. So tightening the screws of regulation in the absence of rapidly expanding public expenditure has obvious limitations. So the next article is how to list cases better. So we are having a lot of pendency cases in High Court and Supreme Court. So how we are going to tackle all these cases, how we are going to solve all these cases. Uh, pendency is a perennial problem. So national pendency count is pegged at around 2.3 million cases. So it is like 2.3 million cases are still pen, uh, pending in the High Courts and Supreme Courts. So it is like if you see the uh, numbers, Apex Court have like 54,719 cases, High Courts have 1.65 lakh cases and subordinate courts have 2.6 crore cases. So if you calculate there are 10 judges per million so it is like a very meager number of judges per million people so also there is one irony which is increasing awareness and false cases there is one side there
there is awareness is increasing so people are now going to the uh, courts to put the cases but there is another side there is false cases is also getting increased so the trial and the judgment takes 1095 days which is uh, nearly three years and for enforcement it takes like 305 days which is like uh, one year so totally for solving or for resolving a single case it took like four years so a high cost of engaging lawyers and other court costs also so the district courts presently have to deal with a broad range of civil criminal and commercial cases so it is also the um, the ambit of the district court is also getting increased like it covers a broad range of civil criminal and commercial cases which is also a burden to the district courts administrative apathy which means administrative indifference is also prevailing in the supreme courts and the high courts so which leads to the uh, pendency of the cases so the recent initiative Chief Justice of India Deepak Mishra recently flagged or raising the concern about the pendency in the appeals lying with high courts based on the information or data of the Supreme Court's Arrears Committee. So this article says cases listing practices influenced case movement and harbored the pendency which means whatever we are following whatever methods we are following as of now for the case listing case listing so it is actually increases the pendency so we have to follow some good way of case listing so that we can decrease the pendency so the first uh, barrier is like listing patterns were generally erratic so the second one is large number of cases remains end of the day remained left over so the cases in the final stages of hearing most often clog the case pipeline so the third one is old pending matters barely made it to the court so these are the barriers so how to list cases better so how to work on it so the judicial case management is on important measure like cost list preparation which is a scientific method and final hearing to be made first and old matters need to be prioritized so the time limit for cases example in Slovakia Republic it is like 60 days per case so similarly commercial fast track courts can be deployed to ease the burden of the courts India spend has found no direct correlation between the judicial vacancies and the performance of a court so it is like there is no direct correlation between the number of judges present in a court and the quality or the uh, judgment provided or delivered to the uh, people by the court so there is no direct correlation for example when Ch while Chennai's lawyer courts dispose criminal cases the quickest the Coimbatore's lawyer courts are the slowest organizing the core judicial aspects of the court and the administration of the court function like a Lord Wolf of UK says that you should not uh, separate these two things like uh, core judicial aspects of the court is to deliver the justice to the people for the cases and also the administration of the court they both should be correlated or they both should be go hand in hand that is what they suggest so outsourcing to record manage and analyze so that we can come to a conclusion of how to uh, make th the scientific approach or how to solve these cases efficiently so recommendation of law commission of India to 30th report so it is these are all the recommendations there are strict guidelines for the grant of adjournments curtailing the vacation time in the higher judiciary if at all these recommendations we follow then we can reduce the number of pendency of cases so in this point of view if you read the all these points strict guidelines for the grant of adjournments curtailing the vacation time in the higher judiciary reducing the time for oral arguments unless the case involves a complicated questions of law framing clear and decisive judgments to avoid further litigation digitizing the court's records has been a good start in this context but a lot more can be done so digitizing is also a one way to make the uh, pendency of cases numbers reduction or to make the judgment fast so in this case for example we can make use of the artificial intelligence to assist the lawyers and the judges in case of uh, solving the cases so as we know justice delayed this much is justice compromised so the next article is interpol red notice so this purpose of an interpol red notice a red notice is a request to locate and provisionally arrest an individual pending extradition so it is not an international arrest warrant so why it is then red notice important so it is not like it is not an arrest warrant then why it is important so it gives high international visibility to cases criminals and suspects are flagged to border officials making travel difficult if at all a red notice is given against a person then the person can't be able to travel across the borders so the countries can request and share the critical information linked to the investigation so self-determination interpol cannot compel any member country to arrest an individual who is the subject of a red notice so it can't or it cannot have the authority to compel the member country to arrest an individual each member country decides for itself what legal value to give a red notice within their border so they can decide 
uh, what value should be given to that red notice within their border. So they can take the steps. So how is a red notice issued first? So police in one of the member countries request a red notice via their National Central Bureau and provide the information on the case to them. So the Interpol General Secretariat publishes the notice after a compliance check is completed. So the next article is CVC which is the Central Vigilance Commission. So the Central Vigilance Commission was set up by the government of India in February 1964 on the recommendations of Committee on Prevention of Corruption headed by Sri K. Santanam to advise and guide the central government agencies in the field of vigilance. So uh, we, what we want to know is this appointment procedure. So the President of the India appoints the Central Vigilance Commissioner and the Vigilance Commissioners. The Central Vigilance Commissioner and the Vigilance Commissioners are appointed by the President of India on the recommendation of the Prime Minister. Home Minister and the leader of opposition in the Lok Sabha. So you have to know what is the appointment procedure for the Central Vigilance Commissioner and Commissioners. So it clearly indicates that the appointments of the CVC are indirectly under the government's control. So the important features of the CVC Act 2003. So these are the features. The Commission that is the Central Vigilance Commission shall consist of a Central Vigilance Commissioner and not more than two Vigilance Commissioners. So the Central Vigilance Commissioner and the Vigilance Commissioners shall be appointed appointed by the president on the recommendation of the committee already we saw right I mean uh, the president is the one who is going to appoint the vigilance commissioners on the recommendation of the prime minister minister of home affairs and the leaders of opposition so the term of office of the central vigilance commissioner and the vigilance commissioners would be like four years from the date on which they enter the office or till they attain the age of 65 years whichever is earlier so it is the term of the CVC commissioners so this commission while conducting the inquiry shall have the powers of a civil court with respect to certain aspects